I, I think about first off, you have to have knowledge of what of what you're trying to lead. Um, <laughs> then you have to be decisive. A leader, I believe, anybody who's going, well, we could go this way or we could go. No, <laughs> this is the way we're going. Okay, right away. The minute somebody says, hey, this is the way we're going, most other people will go, oh, okay. You know, there's a freeway off ramp, right? Yeah. Somebody yeah. says, hey, let's take this off ramp. Okay, we will. Hey, that drop shot of leadership wisdom is from my new friend and doubles partner, Hawk Koch, American film producer for major movies such as Chinatown, Heaven Can Wait, and Wayne's World, also known in Hollywood as the guy who gets things done. Today, we talk about how Hawk stepped out of the shadow of his legendary father, the importance of being a fearless leader, and the story behind Hawk's amazing book, Magic Time, My Life in Hollywood. Hawk, thanks so much for being with me today. I'm happy to be here. Nice to meet you, Renee. So, you know, one of the reasons why I reached out, really the primary reason I reached out was uh, because your book really had an impact on me. Uh, Magic Time, uh, My Life in Hollywood uh, is really your story of personal transformation. Um, I want to start with a line that you presented in the prologue. And you say, you know, I grew up believing I was supposed to measure up to my dad. And on that note, I want to sort of ha hand the mantle or the Oscar, so to speak, over to you and kind of, you know, give us a little bit of insight and, and story behind the book and why you decided to, to go into print. Well, um, I've been making movies my whole life. And uh, I always remember all the stories, all the fun stories, all the good stories. But uh, I always wanted to write a book. Everybody would always say, will you please write these stories down? And I didn't want to make a book just about, you know, a bunch of stories that does, didn't have any through line, any thread that kept them together. And uh, my wife, Molly, who helped me with the book, uh, and I were talking one day and said, well, you know, the thread is the relationship with your father and how your life how that happened. My father was, uh, his name was Howard Koch. And uh, no matter where I went from the time I was a little kid, when I was introduced as Howard Koch Jr., they didn't talk to me, people. They talked about my father. Uh, and they'd say, oh, do you know, boy, you must be so proud. Your dad's the most <laughs> wonderful man. Do you know what he did for me, for my cousin, for my sister, for my aunt? <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, it, he, you know, they would say, well, please, you must be so proud. Please say hello for me. Well, this didn't continue like when I was four. This continued <laughs> when I was four, 14, 24, 34, 44. And it didn't happen monthly. It didn't happen weekly. It happened daily. And people who know me and have been around me, think, oh, you know, people go, oh, you're exaggerating. No, I'm not. <laughs> Even today. My father has been gone 21 years. Still, I'll go somewhere and meet somebody who knew my dad and they'll, they'll talk about my father. The difference for me finally was at 49 years old, having a non-religious family uh, uh, and having just had a relationship that I was in break up, I was looking to do something spiritual for my 50th birthday. And um, a good Catholic friend of mine said, well, I know you were never bar mitzvahed and I've been to your children's bar and bat mitzvahs. Can you get bar mitzvahed at 50? And I didn't know. And I thought, wow, what a good idea. What a great thing to do for your 50th birthday. And I went around and met this rabbi who was amazing. And he talked to me for a half hour. Okay. And at the end, he said, well, who are you? And I said, oh, <laughs> I'm a movie producer. <laughs> and he went, no, 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 no. Who are you? And I said, oh, um, I'm a father and I'm a son. And he looked at me kind of a little, not angry really, but really delving deep, said, who are you? And I don't know where it came from in me, but I said, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Jewish man. And he said, that's a start. He said, what's your Hebrew name? He said, what's your Hebrew name? 
And I said, my parents were non-religious. My name is Howard Koch Jr. I, I, I was never given a Hebrew name. And then the rabbi said, well, for your 50th birthday and your, 50, and your bar mitzvah, which I found out you can get bar mitzvah at any age, for your bar mitzvah, you'll be given your own name. Well, when he said that, having been Howard Koch Jr. for 49 years, I broke down and he said, what's going on? And I said, well, I just realized after 49 years, I want my own name. And then he said the words that changed my life 26 hmm. years ago. Uh, and I, he said, you can have your own name. What a rabbi told me I could have my own name. And we talked, you want to be known as Renee or Frank or Jerry or, uh, you know, whatever. No. And he's, did you ever have a nickname? And my initials are HWK, which is another story about the W, <laughs> HWK. And a few people called me Hawk, but it never really stuck. And he said, do yeah. you know anything about Hawks? And I said, uh, well, Hawks are, uh, you know, bird of prey. He said, well, Hawks can see from horizon to horizon. And they can also see like a squirrel a half a mile away. Wouldn't it be great if you could see the panoramic of your life and the detail always at the same time? And I thought, wow, this guy's good. He's and, good. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, and I said, but isn't Hawk a pretentious name? And he said, it's only pretentious if you allow it to be. <laughs> and um, I went away and uh, really thought about it. And... Uh, Decided, okay, at 50 years old, three kids, <laughs> um, you know, a life of friendships and relationships and stuff. Can I change my name from Howard Koch Jr. to Hawk? And uh, I decided to do it. Um, so I think you have the name of your the name of your next book, which is "You Can Have Your Own Name." I, it's that's pretty empowering stuff, right there. Yeah. So uh, the, that, that, as much as I loved my father, all the way through, I had to learn. I always had my own feeling, but to have my own name, people looked at me differently. And when I met people who knew my dad, they'd go, oh, wow, what an interesting name. How'd you get that name? Yeah. And all of a sudden, they were talking to me as opposed to talking about my father. Yeah, I mean, you, you're really talking about I, the power of identity and the value of connecting with human beings. Um, and, you know, before, you know, we went live on the call, you know, we, we agreed that sort of our theme would be leadership and to sort of, you know, not frame your story in that context in terms of your transformation. I wanna go back, cause you mentioned um, that time and maybe the diner with your friend, is it Lucchese? Is yeah, Gary Lucchese. Yeah. And one of the things he said, and you mentioned in your book, which I think is, I caught it the second time. I was kind of just going through. And, you know, the first time I read very fast through because that's my nature, right? I just wanted, how many things can I get done, you know, in 60 minutes? Um, but one of the things he mentioned was he would observe you attending friends and families bar and bat mitzvahs and every single time you showed some pretty visible emotion like you know you felt there was a presence there and I was wondering if you'd be willing to sort of dig in and, and say you know maybe share why why do you think you know those those celebrations meant so much to you well um as you said at the beginning that I lived a few doors out of Beverly Hills, I always felt like as when I did, I ended up going to Beverly Hills schools and I was quote unquote, an out of district student. <laughs> and as I think about it, and as you mentioned this, when, when my kids were barn bat mitzvah and that right, that ritual that went on, I always felt like, because I was never pushed by my parents to ever do anything because they were off with their own lives. I missed that. I was out of, I wished I had had that as a child. Yeah. Um, but I was never pushed. It's like, I don't know about you. I mean, 
do I wish, you know, somebody gave me uh, tennis lessons as a kid? You know, I, I wish I learned tennis when I was, I don't know, like 18 or 19. By There's that still time, hope. Uh, <laughs> There's still hope. There's still hope. <laughs> yeah. too, too, too many pulled hamstrings now, but... Uh, <laughs> But um, yeah, I can tell you but, some stories. So I guess that's, yeah, that was that's the emotion that comes up for me when there are things that happen that I wish I had had I been a had I been I guess everybody feels gee I wish my parents had been like Mr. Smith's down down the street or something. But I also wish you know nobody ever. Do you play an, a musical instrument? No. <laughs> Nobody ever said, and I never was pushed anywhere. I always kind of had to do it on my own. It, it's so interesting that in terms of the gap, right, that you were feeling there and experiencing, it's totally a leadership gap because what do leaders do? Leaders push you. They push you outside of your comfort zone, right? They're not there uh, to be popular. You know, they're there to be respected and to get the most out of your potential. Can can we transition a little bit? Because I know you, you grew up on sets. And one of the things I love, which is so much about you that I've learned thus far, is that you don't have two lives. You have one life, right? You love what you do. And you not only that, but you really have a love and a passion for the people that are in the business, which I think is rare. You know, I think a lot of people would love to have that sense of wholeness. Can you? share with us what leadership qualities and traits did you observe, you know, watching your dad at work, you know, growing up, maybe the good and the, the good and the bad, and then maybe transition into how you started to get things done. And we'll get to that quote that really, I think, speaks to, to who you are. Well, I, I, I think about, first off, you have to have knowledge of what of what you're trying to lead. Um, <laughs> then you have to be decisive. A leader, I believe, anybody who's going, well, we could go this way or we could go, no, <laughs> this is the way we're going, yeah. okay? Right away, the minute somebody says, hey, this is the way we're going, most other people will go, oh, okay, you know, there's a freeway off ramp, right? Yeah. Somebody yeah. says, hey, let's take this off ramp. Okay, we will. Yeah. Um, you have to prep. I think preparation is the most important thing to have knowledge of your subject and to be decisive. You must have prep. Uh, when you watch, uh, you know, Wimbledon just a couple of weeks ago, whatever it was, people say, you know, wh what did, what did, uh, so, oh, I think it was the British Open, the golf tournament. And they talked about how, how Rory McElroy, three hours before, his tee off time, he was in the gym, working out, getting ready. Then he went to the driving range. Then he went to the putting range, you know, to the, uh, to the, to the putting green. So that by the time he got there, he was ready. And I think that as a leader, if you have prepped, if you know exactly what you want to do and why you want to do it, along with consideration for others and integrity, I think then you have to have the courage to be able to sway others. I think you, a lot of people live in fear. And I think if you have the courage to say, hey, this is the way we're gonna go, guys. We're gonna get out there and we're gonna do X. And then the last thing is, and this doesn't come immediately, but if you've been decisive and if you have knowledge of your, of your subject and if you have, you've prepped, and you have the courage to say it, I think the other people around you will have trust in you. And if they trust you, then when it's time to do whatever it is, boom, they're on their way. So I think that's kind of, that's kind of my kind of encapsulated thing about leadership is know what, you, know what the subject is. Uh, maybe I'm saying it too many times, but how to prep for it, uh, uh, have the courage to do it, know that they'll trust you, and then be decisive and go ahead and do it. Now, 
did you see some of these elements in your dad's work? How did you come to sort of develop this leadership approach that you have that's proven to be so effective? Well, A, I think it was in my genes. <laughs> and I don't mean Levi's. <laughs> um, but B, yes, I, I was on movie sets and I watched my father and I watched but the, the director, if my dad was producing or when he was the director, or the assistant director, who literally led this group of sometimes 40, sometimes 140 people from A to B to C to D. And by the end of the day, they had accomplished their day's work. So yeah, I, I watched that and then I kind of emulated it uh, in school. Uh, I remember, um, and I think it was my freshman year in high school where our coach said, uh, we were, I was playing basketball, uh, I guess on the JV team or something. And he said, no, I don't want anybody switching. Stay with your man. Well, I got screened. I got screened, so I yelled switch, right? So the other guy would, well, when I got in the locker room at halftime, not a nice coach, he took his, his you know, his uh, clipboard and he hit me over the head with it. And he said, who are you, Coach Koch? And from that time on, I was known <laughs> as coach. <laughs> there you go. So, so it was in, it is in your DNA, right? Um, yes. So Bruce Lee has a great, had a great quote, right? He said, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once. I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. And as I was going through your book, I mean, you were succeeding, like almost, almost every example story throughout the book is not a success story. There's some, you know, there were some setbacks. I think your first movie as a producer maybe didn't go as well as you, as you hope. Um, but I came to the conclusion that Hawks one kick is getting things done. You actually became known as the guy who gets things done. Can you share just a little bit of how that came about and just this, this natural inclination to bring projects to successful conclusions? Uh, well, I th <laughs> thank you. Um, I don't know that it was all as easy as maybe you're <laughs> thinking, uh, but I do believe there's a great book, if, you ha if people haven't read it, uh, by Malcolm Gladwell. Um, and of course, I forgot the name of the book, uh, but we can- Outliers? The Outliers. Okay. And it is about, it is about, you know, the Beatles spent eight or nine months in, in uh, Munich playing music eight hours a day at some, you know, crappy bar or someplace. So all of a sudden the Beatles didn't just, oh, we're great, you know. They knew it. The hockey players from Canada who started at three years old on it, on, on, on the ice. You know, by the time they're 18, they've already been all-stars and everything else. And man, they play. Well, I feel like having been on a movie set the whole time, I kind of, and peripheral vision and listening. I think yeah. listening is a really, I didn't put that down as one of the, as one of the leadership qualities, yeah. but you must listen and you must give everybody a chance to hear and to say what they feel and then put all those together and go, you know, I may be leading this way, but every, nobody else wants to go that way. So I, I've got to be malleable enough. Uh, but I think that, I think I learned it. And then as you do it, I think if you're, if you're awake and aware <laughs> yes. of, of what's going on, uh, then, th th then, those 10,000 hours don't take, don't have to take years and years and years. And I loved the people that I worked with. And by the time I was old enough to, to actually run my own set, I had already learned what the prop man and what the costume designer and what the production designer, what the sound man, what the grips and the electrician. I learned what everybody's job was on a movie. So therefore I had respect and they respected me because I knew their job. I think that's another thing about leadership. If you're running a factory and you have no idea <laughs> you know, how, how, 
how you make the how you make the uh, the Snickers bars. It's yeah. Just, you know what caramel? What's caramel? Yeah. You know you have to know you have to know your your thing, and I knew it. So therefore, and you get praise if you know what you're doing. Yeah. And you have the courage to do it, and you actually say it, and it works. People go, "Wow, I trust this guy." Where are we going tomorrow? You know. Did, did you feel uh, because your dad was who he was that you were treated differently by your peers on a set, especially maybe at the beginning? You know, and like, well, here's yeah. a story. Yeah, here's a story. It's true. Um, I was fortunate enough to get a, a job on a movie. It was called This Property is Condemned. It starred Natalie Wood and a young actor in his second film, Robert Redford, who, you know. Um, and uh, by luck, uh, the first assistant director got hurt on day one and quit. And the second assistant director became the first. And we were down in a place called... Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and they needed a second assistant director. And I, I was the production assistant on the movie. And they went, hey, this kid knows what he's doing. He's been around a set all his life. You, today, you're the second assistant director. Well, for me, I was 19 years old. Are you kidding? I love it. And I knew exactly what a second assistant director did. And I was running around. And it's about a week later. And I'm having a ball as the second AD and I'm in the bathroom and two of the crew walk in to wash their hands or whatever. I'm in a stall and one of them says to the other, hey, you know, the only reason uh, that kid Koch got the job is because his dad's head of Paramount Studios. And my heart sunk, really sunk. Yeah. And the other guy, thank God, looked at him and said, yeah, you're right. He probably did get the job but he's working his ass off. He's a terrific kid. So why don't you give him a break? And I realized that day that I had to work harder than anybody else. And I never brought up my dad when I was working. I was just me. And you had, a, you ha you had to either like me or not like me and think I was doing good or not, just on my own. And that was really important to me. I, it's funny, I always think about uh, the announcers on uh, on all the big tennis championships. McEnroe usually gets the, you know, the finals and everything. And his brother, I must say, I'm impressed with his brother. He's the brother of John McEnroe. Um, I don't know if he ever won a tournament. If I'm sure he could play tennis. He was a good man, player. Yeah. But he holds his own. He holds his own. And I don't look at him as John McEnroe's brother. I look at him when I'm watching and listening to him as a knowledgeable man who knows who knows the tennis game and understands and knows knows the history of whoever he's talking about, you know, and he's a good announcer. So I, I think that, you know, through the years, nobody could ever replace my father. He was the nicest man in Hollywood. He was loved by everybody. And I was never going to be that. But I did know that the people who I've talked to through my life respected me for what I was able to do. I love it. I don't it. know if that answered your question, but. No, I actually, I got very lucky with that question because I wasn't looking to point you to the story, you know, in the bathroom, that story. And I remember that story and it's, and it's awesome. Um, I think you actually got really lucky with Natalie Wood. Can you share that story? really quickly yes. yes well natalie wood as in 1965 was the biggest female star in hollywood she was starring in the movie and as i said i became a second assistant director right away and they said all right go get natalie wood that's one of your jobs is to go to where the dressing rooms are and go get the stars because we're ready to shoot the film and i didn't walk i ran from the set you know, about 70, 80 yards to the, to the trailer. And I knocked on her door and I said, uh, we're ready for you. And she said, uh, oh, I'll be out in a few minutes. And I don't know where it came from, but I said, oh, 
Well, our cinematographer, James Wong Howe, two-time Oscar winner. Our, our cinematographer, Mr. Howe, said that uh, the light's perfect. <laughs> she opened the door, she looked at me, she took my arm, and we walked up to the set. And when she went on to the set, everybody came to me and said, how'd you get Natalie Wood out of her trailer? She never comes out of her trailer the first time. <laughs> and I said, I, I told her the light was perfect. I've been using that on actors and actresses my whole life. <laughs> and it works because, you know, if you know actors and actresses, they're very vain. They're scared to come out of the trailer because you got to have courage. I mean, I was just, I, who, what was I watching? Um, I was watching something yesterday where uh, they said that, oh, this great, great documentary about Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward called The Last Movie Stars. It's great. It's on HBO. Watch it. I'll check it out. And, and, Paul, and they were talking about Paul Newman and why he always had to change T-shirts. If he had a T-shirt in a scene, and I worked with Paul twice, he always changed shirts because he was, he was sweating, but I never knew why he was sweating. And what he told the interviewer was he was always scared when he went into work scared he was one of the greatest actors of all time but he was scared yeah. and actors are scared to get out and go on the set because they know when you say print that's going to be on a 100 foot screen one day and it's them up there yeah. so that's kind of and by the way through the years sorry to go back to the actors trusted me therefore I didn't bring them out and then they had to sit out there and wait because we weren't ready. If, if that was the case, they'd say, well, why'd you call me out? I'm not, you know, you're not ready. But if I brought them out, it meant, oh, we're ready to go. Let's go, let's, let's do the scene. So, you know, as leaders, we get lucky. And if we're doing our work, it's really, it's a result of the preparation, right? But often we need to be audacious and bold. And I know you've got a great story uh, about working with Dustin Hoffman. I was hoping that you can share that story with us sure. a little bit. Sure. Uh, I, I, I had the first movie I was producing fell apart after seven days of shooting. We shut down the movie. I lost not only my first job as a producer, that same day, my first wife asked me to get out of the house. <laughs> so I lost my personal life and my career in one day. And about a month later, I got a call from a very important producer who said he was in trouble on a movie uh, and could I help? And I ended up flying overnight, taking the red eye to New York City and going up to a place called Mount Kisco. Uh, and, I know Mount Kisco well, yeah. Yeah, and we were shooting in Bedford. They were shooting and it was a movie called Marathon Man. Great movie, by the way. And uh, the director was the Academy Award-winning director, John Schlesinger, who had directed Midnight Cowboy. The cinematographer was Conrad Hall, the amazing cinematographer, Butch Cassidy, et cetera, Academy Award winner, and Academy Award winner, Dustin Hoffman. So these three, and they're 10 days behind after 10 days of shooting, and the producer who never ever came to the set said, take over. <laughs> So uh, I decided when I got there the first day just to watch what was going on that first day. And at the end of the day, I'd make my recommendations. Well, we get out there and the director um, is, can't make up his mind on what the first shots should be. It's a drive up. Dustin Hoffman and the actress or Martha Keller are supposed to drive up to this house. And he can't decide what lens, where to shoot it from. Conrad Hall, the cinematographer, is making all kinds of things. And Dustin Hoffman has come up to Schlesinger at about 8.30, 9 o'clock. And we've been there since 7. Nobody's doing a thing because the director can't make up his mind that Dustin doesn't, isn't happy with the scene. And he wants John to come in and they'll rewrite it. And it's now 10 o'clock. <laughs> the crew is playing frisbee there's nothing to do and i thought what am i why did they get me here right i had read the script i knew the problems i've been on sets all my life i knew what the problems were 
And I went and I knocked on the trailer door and John Schlesinger opened the door and said, yes, British man. Yes, yes. And I said, I want to talk to you. And I brought Connie Hall, our cinematographer with me. And he said, well, I'm talking to Dustin. I said, no, we're, you and I are going to talk now. And I said, John, you're the director. You have, you are the one who tells us what to do and you have to know what to do before we get there. When we get there in the morning, a drive up, you know what lens and where you want to shoot it from. Connie, Conrad Hall, you have one chance to make a, another suggestion. And between those two, John, you're going to make up your mind. And we're going to get out there and we're going to shoot. And Dustin Hoffman at the other end of the, uh, <laughs> of the trailer said, well, what does this have to do with me, right? Actor, what does this have to do with me? It's all about him. <laughs> And I looked at him, I said, you have every right to have a problem with a scene. And he kind of smiled. I said, a week ahead of time, I was 29, by the way, <laughs> I, a, a week ahead of time, you have no right on the day of shooting to have, a, to have a problem with the scene. I will get William Goldman, the writer of that great movie, Marathon Man, as well as Butch Cassidy. I'll get William Goldman up here from New York. We'll sit down. We'll go through the whole next week's work and we'll always keep a week ahead of time. But today you're going out, you're shooting the scene as written. They looked at me, all three of them, whoa, <laughs> geez. We went out there, we got the day's work done. We lost one day in the next 75 days of shooting and it changed my career because it's a small town Hollywood, even though we make movies all over the world, everybody knew, wow, Koch, he stands up for, stands up and he knows what he's doing and it changed my career. So that's the, that's the, that's that story. This, this was Hawk with an A before you were actually Hawk with the A. We're in, yes. the, we're in the fifth set of our uh, leadership okay. conversation. So I, okay. I want to wrap things up with, um, with you sharing how you got put that A, you know, in there in, sure. in Hawk. Sure. And then I have a few sure. rapid fire fun questions and, and we'll bid sure. ourselves to do. Sure. Um, well, as I said, when the rabbi said to me, you know, uh, you can be Hawk. Uh, and I went up to a place called Telluride, Colorado, just to take a week and try and think through, can I really change my name? And as I said, my initials are HWK and I'm walking on the street and there's a Native American selling little trinkets. And there was this one little trinket. It was a rectangle that you wore around your neck, very cheap, five bucks. And it said, listen on the bottom. And there was a little cloud and a lightning bolt on this little piece of faux silver. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, do you know the way we listen between the lightning and the thunder? how we can smell it, we can see it, we can hear it, we can taste it, we can feel it. Wouldn't it be great if you could be that awake and aware and attuned all the time in your life, as opposed to only between the lightning and the thunder? And I thought, wow, I bought that trinket, I wear it all the time. And it was the A in Hawk, H-A-W-K, and I've tried very hard to be awake, aware, and attuned in my life. And you are. And I'm grateful. Oh, I have a few thank rapid you. fire questions to, sure. to wrap up. Favorite sure. movie of all time? Casablanca. Worst job you ever had? Oh, a movie called uh, The Temp. <laughs> okay. Favorite quote? Uh, favorite quote. Wow, that's a hard one. One of my favorite lines of a movie is the last line in HUD. Paul Newman says, you know some fantan, this world is so full of crap. A man's got to get into it sooner or later, whether he likes it or not. <laughs> that's a good one. That's a really good one. Uh, and I, I'm excited because I have a long list of movies that, um, that I can start watching after this conversation. Favorite word? Smile. Favorite animal? Uh, dog. If you could live anywhere you want other than 
I think you're in LA or in that in that area. Just outside of LA, yeah. Yeah. Where, where would you live? I could live. Boy, I'm telling you, this place, Ojai, uh, is a pretty beautiful place. <laughs> um, Strong I, I, tennis I'm, community. I'm pretty happy. Here. I'm yes. pretty happy here. Oh, that's but, where you are now. You're in Ohio. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Ohio. There's a ton of tennis in Ohio. I'm sure you're already you're already aware. Oh of yeah, that. sure. Uh, yeah. Favorite song. Uh, favorite song. Um, probably Marvin Gaye. What's going on? There you go. Favorite mantra. There's only one answer for this. Favorite mantra. Favorite I mantra. Can't tell you my mantra. Um, magic time. Thank you. Everybody needs to get this book. Hey, you're a Thanks. special person. I'm really grateful um, that you've taken the time to, to have this conversation and connect. And uh, where can people find you online, Hawk? Uh, they can just go to magictime.pictures uh, is my uh, website. And uh, or you can just Google Hawk Koch, H-A-W-K-K-O-C-H, and you'll find me and you can get, if you like, if you like the way I talk, you can listen to the book on Audible if you're one of those people who takes long hikes. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Renee. You're terrific. And if you're ever out this way, please let me know, will you? I, will. I don't know if you ever play, your team's ever come to the West Coast, but if they do, let me know. I'm working on it. I'll be, right. as, as the, the famous line, I'll be in touch. <laughs> right, okay. All right, man. Great no, to I, meet you. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Take care. Yep. Hope you enjoyed listening to Renee Vidal sharing stories of peak performance. Remember to listen, watch, subscribe, and review anywhere you get podcasts. Keep dominating on and off the court.